Um, so thank you all for coming today. It's, it's so nice to be in person. I know last year we did this virtually and it, it was great, um, but just seeing everyone in person, meeting people has been amazing. Um, and I'm super excited for today's talk. Caxel and I are gonna talk about something that we've been thinking about at Astronomer over the last couple months as LLMs have gotten more and more popular. Um, if you haven't had a chance to meet us yet, definitely come find us afterwards. My name is Julian. I am on the product team at Astronomer, but end up doing both product and engineering work. Uh, Caxel, you want to introduce well, yourself? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Good morning. Um, I'm Kakshil Naik. I'm introducing myself for the third time. So <laughs> I'm the committed NPMC member of Airflow. You know this. I'm the director of engineering at Astronomer. You know this as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> So yeah, let's talk about LLMs. Um, oh, but before we do that, let's go to the agenda. Like why Airflow uh, should be at the center of LLM ops. Um, want to quickly go through that because there, has, there have been a lot of architectures discussed about uh, LLMs and the uh, general uh, real world architectures and we would really want to put our foot down on, on that as well. Um, go through a real use case and the reference architecture for a specific use case which we are very excited to talk about today. And then the next steps and how the community can collaborate with, with us on, on that front. So, like we just mentioned, LLMs, they are making the world crazy, right? Uh, we all need to find new jobs. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I have started creating my CV, but well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let's get into LLM side of things, right? Uh, traditionally, ML requires something, something like this. Uh, you ingest some data, you train a model, and you make predictions. For LLMs, it's different. Uh, the model already exists and is already trained on a large data set. Um, talk about Llama, uh, Llama 2 from Facebook or Meta. Um, they're trained on a large data set and you can use less data. You don't need to ingest vol the huge volumes of data that you traditionally used for other ML use cases. And here you can use the model as just an API uh, to make predictions. So easy enough. Um, but Although LLMs are easy to prototype, um, making them into production uh, and using your enterprise data is a little more challenging than just prototyping, right? Um, and I'll go through some of these challenges and this might sound a bit familiar. So, ingesting data from diverse sources. Um, ingesting from several sources is not the problem. The problem comes when there are service inter interruptions between those sources. What if my data is not available from one of the service providers? Uh, and ensuring that the, there's a data reliability during, during that process. Day two operations, uh, such as like managing uh, changing data sources, the data format changed without the data provider telling me. Um, handling network blips, we, we all know uh, DNS is always the issue, right? Uh, so <laughs> um, making sure we have retries and stuff. Um, then data preparation and privacy, like ensuring data is clean, transformed, and co uh, compliant with uh, privacy regulations uh, is important, like including redacting PII data. Uh, <laughs> or else you will have your uh, IT team uh, and HR team contacting you via emails like we, we do at <laughs> Astronomer. So, um, so and uh, tracking data lineage is also important, making sure where the data is coming from, where it is flowing. Data freshness and timeliness, like you don't want your model to predict answers that were in September 2021, right? Uh, we want real data, we want data from yesterday, from today. So making sure the data is fresh um, and uh, answers accordingly. Model deployment and monitoring, we want to continuously monitor the performance, the scalability and uh, all the business requirements that the model, model has. Scaling LLM models to Increasing more data sources, uh, just the size of the data sets, experimentation, fine tuning the models, uh, and feedback loops. Like my model can answer a lot of different things, but I know what the correct answer is in most cases. So I want to rate it. Yes, it is the right answer, rate it down. And the model should utilize that feedback for, uh, for answering it next time. So things like that, like prototyping is easy, uh, making it into production. Not really, uh, you, you need to think it through. So, oops, yeah. 
So let's let's uh, talk about one specific use case over here. Uh, and a popular use case of LLMs, right? Question and answering uh, on enterprise data uh, using uh, retrieval augmented generation, RAGs. Uh, so QA &Q application require data from various sources, databases, blob store, uh, structured data, unstructured data. Then uh, splitting it into multiple bite-sized documents uh, so that you can store them in a place where you can look at them while, while answering the query. Uh, that's where vector databases come in and the process of embedding comes in. So you split the, split the documents, you store them in a, a vector database and, and utilize it in the retrieval process. Like this uh, sounds familiar, right? A typical ETL uh, use case, right? And there, there is a popular tool used for ETL. Uh, and its name is Airflow. So we can utilize Airflow for uh, the documenting, loading, splitting, and storage part, the classic ETL stuff. We, we won't go into the other two because I think I just want to focus on the, this part because for data freshness and all the, all the things that I mentioned in the last slide, this is the important stuff, not the model serving and other things, right? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and Airflow fits, fits into this space and it's, uh, it, we want it to be in the center of LLM ops because of all the reasons over there and all these reasons mentioned over here. I, didn't, I won't go into the detail of each of these, but you can see the ones that are highlighted, right? Um, the document passing, ingestion, day two operations, which are absolutely necessary for moving your LLM model to production. Um, now, let's actually look at the real use case. Uh, this is why we are here. We are here to talk about how to build an LLM application with Airflow. So over to you, Julian. Yeah, thanks, Axel. Um, so it's, it's nice to think about how these things work in theory. I think there are lots of articles and guides out there that talk you through, you know, Airflow is good for this. This is how you do it. Um, but it's also very nice to have concrete examples of apps that have been deployed or running in production um, and that you can reference in your own use cases. So we've spent the last couple months at Astronomer working um, on a problem that we have, which is customers, employees, even myself, have lots of questions about Airflow as I'm writing DAGs. Documentation is very fragmented. You'll find documentation in the Airflow docs, the Astronomer docs. You'll find them in GitHub issues. You'll find them in Slack threads. And so if you're just getting started with Airflow, it's difficult to know where to go for answers. So what we wanted to do was build an easy interface for folks to ask questions about Airflow and get them answered um, without caring about where the actual source is coming from, just that the answer is correct. So we built something that we call Ask Astro, and I'm actually going to jump into a live demo here. So everybody cross your fingers for me. I'm also trying to do this on another screen. Let's see if I can. Perfect. Um, so Ask Astro is exposed in two ways. There is a UI. Um, that's useful for people who have quick questions um, and want answers. We've also built a Slack bot for it that we've been using internally whenever you know, folks on our field, customer teams, have questions about Airflow or someone from our data engineering team is writing a DAG. They have an interface directly in Slack to ask questions um, without annoying the Airflow experts like Axel. So... Let's ask it a question. My favorite, um, when I first started learning Airflow, the execution date was always confusing to me. So I'm going to ask it, what is the execution date in Airflow? Hopefully there are no typos. I can't see that well. Um, so what's going to happen under the hood is it's making a request to several places. The first is our vector database that we've set up where we store all of our documentation, all of the Apache Airflow documentation. We're ingesting GitHub issues. We're ingesting Slack conversations, lots of different sources. It's then going to take those relevant documents and pass it to a powerful large language model, um, GPT-4 in this case, and generate an answer. 
This is actually, you know, when I asked this last night, I, I'm not going to go through and read the full answer now. It was one of the most clear and coherent answers that I've seen of what is the execution date in Airflow. There can be lots of confusion. It's actually set to the day before the DAG is run. When I first started running, you know, my, my first DAG that I was building, I would click run and I would be very confused about why it was trying to pull data from a different date. Um, and the reason for that is, is when you are executing your DAG at midnight, you actually do want to look back a day and make sure that you're pulling data that is there instead of accidentally look forward a day. It also correctly calls out that you should use now the data interval start and data interval end instead of the execution dates, and that the execution date was renamed to the logical date, and those two are, are equivalent. Um, so it's a nice, easy way to get a very human-readable, understandable answer. I didn't have to spend 30 minutes Googling and understanding each part of the execution date separately. So it's certainly a fun demo, but I think the most important part is how we built it. Um, so there are kind of three, three different components that I want to talk through. The first is the actual data ingestion. How did we go build a vector database that we knew would reliably have all the information we, ha we have when it needed it and that it was always up to date? The second is when someone submits a question, what actually happens? How are we doing the document retrieval? How are we formatting things? And last but certainly not least is the feedback loop of when someone rates an answer as correct or incorrect, what actually happens? How do we use that information to make the model more accurate? So first is the data ingestion. This is all running entirely on Airflow. Um, I've highlighted a couple of the places that we pull documentation from. So GitHub issues, astronomer docs, Airflow docs, the open source Slack troubleshooting channel, um, there are a couple more that we have in reference material after this. We take in all of those data sources using Airflow, and first we pre-process them and split them using LangChain. LangChain is nice to work with because it comes with a lot of the utilities that you need for splitting markdown by headers or splitting Python code by different class and function definitions. And it's important to split these documents into smaller chunks because ultimately, um, each chunk will be run through an embedding process which tries to semantically capture all of the information. And if you take you know, a 1,000 line markdown document and try to capture it all in 4,000 vectors, you're gonna lose a lot of information. So it's important to get the right level of granularity and that's something that you're gonna to wanna to experiment with and that's something that Airflow is super helpful for to let us parameterize how we do chunking. You can you know, rerun DAGs with backfills um, and you know, continually test the data. After the data is fully pre-processed, split into nice chunks, we then run it through OpenAI for embedding. Um, when the embedding is complete, we ultimately write it to WeV8, um, and then down the line, WeV8 is used for um, like vector retrieval. So this is kind of the process of how we take all of these different data sources, how we embed them, make sure that they're all in the same you know, vector format using the same embedding model, and ultimately write it to WeV8 to be retrieved later. The next component after WeV8 is set up is how we actually go use that data to effectively answer users' questions. So users can ask a question one of two ways. We have the web app that I just showed, we also have the Slack app um, that you know, internal astronomer users can ask questions. Those both get served by the same API. So you're gonna get the you know, same answer, same sources, regardless of where you ask. What we do is we take the original prompt, then we actually use GPT-3.5 to reword it a couple times. The reason we reword it is um, there may be other documents that are actually relevant to the question but are based on a, like, a variation of the user's prompts. So this rewording with a fast model like GPT-3.5 Turbo takes less than two seconds most of the time and means that we get more accurate, more relevant, and just more sources. We then take each of these rewordings, run it through OpenAI for embedding, and do data like document retrieval from wev so for each of these prompts, we're gonna go find the relevant documentation from WeV8. Then we construct a final user prompt, which includes our system prompts explaining to the model that 
It is Ask Astro. It's meant to answer airflow and astronomer questions. If you ask it something that is not airflow or astronomer, it's not going to answer you. We take that. We take the user prompt. So like, what is the user actually asking about? Then we also bring in all of the sources that are relevant based on those three prompt rewordings. We take all of that information. We send it to GPT-4 in this case, which is you know, state of the art right now. It's going to give you the best answer. Um, that'll generate an answer. And ultimately, you write it to, we use Firestore for state management and Langsmith for like query APM tracing. Then once the data is in Firestore, that ultimately gets served back to the user, either when the UI updates like we just saw, or the Slack bot will post a message in the thread. Last but certainly not least is how we do LLM and product feedback loops. So a user then, after they see their answer, has the ability to rate the answer as correct or incorrect. We're exploring you know, more things that you can rate on, but correctness when you're doing question and answers about factual information is the most important. So a user is going to answer, you know, was this information correct? Was it incorrect? Um, there are cases, of course, where they don't answer. We then have another set of Airflow DAGs that run on a schedule and will pull in all of the requests that it has not yet seen. It'll use um, you know, Langchain, Langsmith, and Firestore to pull in those requests so you get the full context of a user asked this question, we were able to pull in these sources and generate this answer. We then actually run a feedback loop back through OpenAI's GPT-4 model. So we use GPT-4 to then rate the answer in addition to the user-provided feedback on three criteria. The first is helpfulness. So in addition to was the answer correct, which we trust the user for, was the answer helpful? Did it give the user what they were looking for? We rate it on relevance. So was the answer actually answering the question that the user directly asked or you know, the, the models are imperfect, sometimes they don't. And then publicness. So is there PII in, in this? Like, Can we process it down the line or do we need to stop here? If all of those things are true, so the answer is correct, it's helpful, it's relevant, it doesn't contain PII, it's okay to be public, um, we do two things. We first show it on the homepage of ask.astronomer.io. So if you look at it um, on initial load, it's going to pull in, I think it's like the dozen most recently asked, fully correct, relevant, helpful answers. So those are actually you know, real questions that users are asking. And we'll actually go write it back to Weviate for use in future answers. So there's some feedback loop with the LLM without having to do fine tuning of, as people are saying answers are correct and incorrect, that context can then be provided back to the model. So if you ask it you know, twice, how do I run Databricks with Airflow? The first answer is good. It can actually use that answer as an example of what a good answer looks like to continually get better. So it was very easy to prototype something like this. We had you know, a couple of Jupyter notebooks running, as one does when prototyping. But like Axel mentioned, when you actually go run this in production, there are a lot of different challenges. Uh, we were experimenting with lots of different data sources to ingest. So we started with just a handful, and over time, added more and more. Um, we were doing both scheduled and ad hoc runs. So when we were actively developing, it was helpful to you know, run entire DAGs and backfills and like full ingestion DAGs as we're introducing new data sources or changing our chunking strategy or playing with model parameters. Um, sometimes like we ran into rate limits when multiple of us were working on it at the same time. So the ability to go retry things in Airflow, you know, halfway through so you don't have to go hit, for example, GitHub's API, you already have that data, you can just try rerunning it through the embedding model with Airflow's like retry ability. That actually happens automatically now. So the chances that it hits rate limits with pooling and retries um, are very small. We played around with giving, giving different parts of the DAGs like different compute availability. So when we were doing pre-processing, which was happening in memory in Airflow, you, know, you want to give something like that more compute. When all you're doing is making an open AI call and waiting for a response, you don't need any compute for that. And we were able to build kind of the standard DAG framework for ingesting new data sources. 
So we actually started pulling in, I think it was another data source on either Monday or Tuesday morning, and it was as easy as just writing the logic to actually pull that data in. Then the embedding process and the write to Weaviate was pretty standard. This is all stuff that Airflow is great at, um, which is why Airflow is pretty critical for this. It was a materially different experience than just running things every day in a Jupyter notebook. Um, and now runs in, in production with no one having to be too concerned about it. So this was a very fun project to work on. I'm, I'm pretty proud of what we built. Um, but what I like the most about it is this is actually now public. So you can go to ask.astronomer.io and ask it questions as you're writing DAGs or curious about it. And we are fully open sourcing it. Um, so this repo will be live immediately after this talk when I can go and GitHub's UI and make it public. <laughs> It'll be public at github.com slash astronomer slash askastro. And we didn't actually develop this in isolation. So Andreessen Horowitz put out an article over summer when if all of this LLM hype was getting started. They went and interviewed a bunch of people who were using LLMs today and come, came up with what they call their reference architecture for building LLM apps. So this is what it looks like. I won't go into too much detail um, because there's a lot there. We actually built Ask Astro as a reference implementation of A16Z's recommended architecture. So the highlighted components here are things that we have built out. There are some things like LLM caching and validation that we have not yet built. Uh, but because this is open source, um, you, you can use this in your own LLM applications as kind of a reference for, hey, you know, I want to go build feedback loops in my LLM app. Like, what's a good example of how can I do that? Now you have a set of Airflow DAGs plus kind of a framework for at least um, starting to think through the issues, if not you know, using our implementation. So in recent Horowitz, they got a lot of things right. There's still a lot more to be done outside of what they recommend. I think data governance and how you account for private data was something that we didn't see talked about a lot. That's what makes these things very powerful. You know, down the line, if we decide that you know we want customers using this, we'll ask ourselves the question of, you know, can we give it context on what airflow deployments they have, what connections they have, are they using certain libraries so that the answer can be more relevant to the individual? Um, how do you provide transparency into data lineage? So what when someone asks it a question, what sources, what is it actually using? How do you know that you trust those sources? How do you know that those sources are good? We have not yet explored fine tuning. We actually found that the accuracy was pretty good with just the Wii V8 vector retrieval, but you know, fine tuning can certainly be helpful. Um, it's something that it might be worth eventually looking into because um, it you know, can improve costs, it can improve accuracy, it can improve style. And then feedback loops, I think there's so much to be done there. Um, what we've done is kind of just scratching the surface. You can build out semantic caches so that if people are asking it about Airflow and Databricks and you know a certain operator twice, it's not having to make an expensive GPT-4 call. It knows that a similar question has been asked before and can just use that answer. Uh, there are feedback loops with sources. So if a source is frequently pulled into answers, those answers are always rated as correct, you know that's a good source. On the other hand, if a source is always pulled in and the answer is always um, incorrect, like that is then motivation to go improve the documentation. And finally, prompt clustering. So you can see trends of what are people asking about, where do we have good documentation, where do we not have good documentation. Uh, this was by far a team effort. Um, so Phil and Michael, you'll see them around actually right here in the audience. I'll point them out. Um, Definitely a, a whole team contribution here. Um, if you see them later, stop them, ask them questions about it. Um, and actually, you take it from here. Cool, yeah, so thank you, Julian. Like, this is where we need your help. Um, this use case is great. We, we open sourced this because we wanted the community to use it, use it as a reference architecture, provide us the feedback, and then answer these questions for us. Um, there are a couple of things we could do, right? Uh, one thing is like, 
what providers do we want to build? Uh, what are the interfaces that we want for such LLM applications and what patterns do we use? So, for example, like there are so many vector databases out there, VV8, PG vector, Pinecone, which is the one that the community is interested in more that we should go, go ahead and build first. Uh, I'm sure there are probably 50 more of them. Um, uh, and then which LLM models, like there's OpenAI, there's Dolly, there's Llama, there's a lot of other things, there's Hugging Face entirely. Um, what, do you, what do you use more often, or what do you at least intend to use more often so that we can build those providers and, and uh, contribute it back to Airflow, or at least have them open source for everyone to use? The interface. Uh, do you want an operator for each vector uh, database? or each LLM model as well, like open AI operator, or do you want a generic universal transfer operator type um, model where you say, hey, I want to use an LLM operator, leave it, uh, I'll leave it up to you to decide uh, the small details, but I still want enough uh, parameterization where I can pass in uh, the things like temperature and, and, and stuff and which models to use, what, what other parameters I could pass. So, these are two different ways of doing the same thing, and it can be evolved, but we would like to hear from you on what you prefer. And also there's a third option. So uh, you could use Taskflow API and use Langchain uh, under the hood to just write all of them uh, in, in plain Python. So which interface are you interested in more? Like we would really love for you, for you all to tell this. Grab us after this talk or even just contact us on Airflow Slack or LinkedIn. Similarly, what are the, yeah, Julian, if you want to take this one. Yeah, yeah. So we, we actually did run into some pattern challenges. Um, you know, are you supposed to use one task for both data ingestion, embedding, and writing to a vector DB? Can you use dynamic task mapping? Can you pass embeddings through XCOMs? Do you need to write things to disk? Uh, these are all, you know, questions that you know, we have thoughts on, but that I think patterns will emerge over time. Yeah, let's do all of this in open source. Uh, let's uh, hopefully benefit the entire community. Uh, look at the code, do let us know. We really want to build this out in open and uh, need everyone's help over here. Uh, Airflow's community is really vast and we really want to uh, put Airflow in the center of LLM ops space. So please grab us and let's, let's kill it.